Um, in World War II, uh, it, it's interesting as you study that America stayed out of the war for a long time. Part of that had been kind of we, uh, so many Americans had died in World War I, and there was this sentiment that, especially after the Great Depression, we should really just kind of focus on ourselves and not get involved in Europe's wars. Of course, nobody knew about the Holocaust, nobody knew all the atrocities that were going on. I think that people thought of what was going on with Germany invading Poland in the same way that we think of Russia invading Ukraine. Well, it's it's something that's going on over there, let them figure it out. But as soon as then Hitler started to march through Europe and Austria fell and France fell and there was a pushing into Great Britain, um, that's when some of the people started to get worried. 81% of Americans when the war started were, were very much against um, Americans getting in, America getting into World War II. And that number just decreased as Hitler and as, um, um, what was that guy's name? Hideki Tojo? Uh, is that right, Russ? You, you would know. Uh, as they started to spread their influence and as Mussolini started to spread his influence and as things got worse, people in America were more apt to say, let's, let's go into World War II. Now, does that mean that we were not, as Americans, as America involved in the war, we were still sending supplies. Uh, our boats were still being attacked by German U-boats. We were still being shelled by the Japanese boats, but we just tried to stay out of it. All of that changed. Public opinion, our involvement in the war, all of that changed on December 7th, 1941, when Japan bombed, unprovoked, Pearl Harbor. And at that moment, we declared war against all the Axis powers, and they all declared war against us. Um, so we immediately conferred with the Allies, and we started to um, focus on Europe, even as we were fighting in the um, South Pacific. We started to coordinate with the Allies in Europe and took down Germany in July of 1945. And then we dropped the nuclear bombs in August of 1945, and the war was over. Um, when the USA then entered the fight, um, we were helping the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, and China uh, end the evil that was going on in the world. And when you think about, just again, as a, as a way of illustrating the idea that um, it, it took us a long time and there were people just trying to get us into the war, this, the same way that Zelensky is trying to get us into the war now, and, and the same way that a lot of um, European and even in the Middle East countries are trying to get us to be involved and to try to stand up to be leaders. And so much of what we're doing in America is just to, to hesitate on that. And I think so many people thought for years then about God, like how could God, maybe you've heard this from atheists, how could God have let so much happen until Jesus Christ came? You know, how, how could all this death and mayhem and everything happen and God didn't do anything about it and now you say that Jesus Christ came into the world and, and what's all this about? Sin had ravaged mankind for centuries and all God did was give the command and the law. Now he did much more than that. If you know the Old Testament, you see God's involvement in all aspects and it's it's, again, amazing to me every time I read through the Bible, the stories and, and the prophecies and everything that shows that God was in every part of the world. But we understand that God, in the fullness of times, it says in Galatians, sent Jesus Christ. That's when God did something. And, and now, looking back 2,000 years, we can celebrate that victory made by Jesus Christ at the cross. The cross is not just at the center of history, it's the center of all of mankind. And though we can talk about what happened before and after, we really need to focus on the cross. There's a reason that we have the cross here, um, that, that this is central to our faith. Now, the tomb is as well, I don't want to take away from that, but what we're going to talk tonight about is the cross. Now, the, Paul in Colossians is writing about the supremacy of Christ not just the supremacy of Christ as a person. He talks about that. He said in chapter 1, verse um, 
15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So the person of Christ is preeminent in Colossians, and now we're looking at the work of Christ, which is preeminent. And again, I didn't really plan this out when I decided I was going to preach through Colossians on Sunday night. I decided that after I'm preaching through Hebrews on Sunday morning, and yet to see the way that they overlap and even their themes are similar has been really amazing to me. Um, now, Hebrew, uh, Colossians and Ephesians more line up, but Colossians really is trying to show the supremacy of Christ in his work. And so what we looked at already, that there's this war, there's this fight. In verse 8 of chapter 2, he says, beware, be careful. There are some that want to spoil you. They want to take what is yours, and they want to do that through philosophy and deceit and tradition and rudiments of the world. And, and don't allow yourself to be dragged off there. But instead, focus on Christ and focus on, more specifically, the work that he has done, his supreme work. What work has Christ done? Well, we've already looked at verse 11, where it says that there was a circumcision made without hands, that there was a severing of us and sin. Last week, we talked about, in verses 12 and 13, that there was a spiritual work, an operation of God, where we were crucified on the cross with Christ. We were buried in the tomb with Christ. We were raised to new life with Christ. And so in Christ, all of that has changed. And so tonight I want to talk about the victory that Jesus Christ won for us. So looking at then, I'll, and I'll start at verse 11 because I want to get kind of a running start. I know I've referenced it already, but let's just read it. So Colossians 2 verse 8, in whom... Also, ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. All right, so what did Christ do on the cross? First of all, Jesus won victory over sin. Notice the end of verse 13. Having... Because of all this that he did, quickened us together with him, having already, through the cross, forgiven you all trespasses. The word trespass means literally to fall aside or to step over a line, to fall away from God's perfect standard. And as you know, that is true of every single one of us. And I think the longer you're saved, the more you understand just how easy it is to fall aside. You also understand that it's not really falling sometimes. Sometimes it's an active stepping outside of God's will. And, uh, but the idea in either way is that we have crossed a boundary that God said, don't cross this. We're going one way, we fall to the other, and that's our state of sin. What did he do because of that? He, what it says here is, have forgiven. He having, having forgiven you all trespasses. The word forgiven means to grant favor of passing over our sins. That God didn't have to do anything about our sins, he could have just punished us. But what we see in the Bible is that God granted us the favor of granting us a pardon that he has forgiven all sins. Now, verse 11, if we're circumcised with Christ, if that circumcision made without hands, that means all of our sins are gone. If the sin, power of sin is gone, the penalty of sin is gone as well. We have been forgiven. In verses 12 and 13, if we died, all of our sins died with him. There are no more sins for God to judge. There's no more wrath for me if our sins are gone, if we are then forgiven. Um, and I have now no connection with my sin. We talked about that. 
in World War II, uh, as the Allies went through Europe and as then there was kind of a pincher um, where we came in through France and as the Soviets had the other front, uh, eventually they chased the Germans, not all of them, but the, the large bulk of the, of the army back to Berlin and uh, Hitler, seeing that it wasn't, that he wasn't going to be victorious, killed himself. Mussolini, uh, having overstepped his powers, was killed in Italy. And at that moment, then, the war was, at least in Europe, effectively over. The antagonists were gone and done. The head of the army was cut off, and then the rest followed. Now, this is especially true in Germany and Italy, where Mussolini and Hitler had kind of created these personality cults for themselves where it really a lot of the passion, a lot of the fervor did come in the persons. It wasn't just like in North Korea, Kim Jong-un is kind of a figurehead. It's really the military generals that are running things. But in, in the case of Hitler and Mussolini, there was these personalities. And as soon as those personalities were gone, everything else dissolved and it was much easier for to get some of the generals to then sign uh, conditions of surrender. Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, we read that as he, again, I mentioned this this morning, that, that the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, that God on the cross put our sins on Jesus Christ. And some of his last words were, it is finished. Now, in English, that's a wonderful thing to think about. It is finished. But in the Greek, the word was tetelestai, which was, was, again, it means it is finished. But often the word tetelestai was what they were put at the top of a bill. We wouldn't say, if you finished off your payments, it is finished. You would say, paid in full, meaning there's nothing left for you to owe. And that's what Christ has done on the cross. He has forgiven us all our trespasses. He has given all, he has taken all of our sins away and he has wiped the board clean of all of our sins. So what does that mean for us now? That means, first of all, that sin has no real power over us. That sin only, if, if the victory has already been won over sin, then sin has no real power over us. The only power that sin has is when we yield to it. Sin cannot make us do anything anymore. It was not always that way, but now as Christians, we have power over sin because Christ has won the victory over sin. We don't have to sin. Satan tells us that we do. He tells us that we have to yield to sin, but we do not. We have victory over sin. We have victory over our, our sinful nature. We have a new nature that we have been given because we have been forgiven by God. When we sin, there is provision for us, right? The Bible says we, we shouldn't sin, but when we do, there is provision for us. We can go and we can take the blood of Jesus Christ and we can ask that to be applied to our, our sins and to be applied to our account and we can take that provision for us. And uh, again, not that we're crucifying Christ afresh, but that we are remembering what he has done for us. And we can go to God and say, God, I've come because I've sinned against you. But I am thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for me. And I know that I have forgiveness with you. Again, it's not a boldness like we can just take it because we have, we've been owed it. We can take it because it has been given to us. The provision for sins has already been given. And we can say, thank you, God, for the provision in Christ. We also then have a new life that wants to walk in righteousness and holiness. Jesus has won victory over sin. Praise God for that. Amen. What else does he do? Jesus also won victory over the law. Look at verse number 14. It says, blotting out the, and then it says, the handwriting of ordinances. The handwriting of ordinances. That indicates a page. That indicates something that was written. And it says that it was, and it says it twice, against us, which is a stumbling block, and contrary to us, which is the same idea as having an adversary. So not only was there this handwriting there to trip us up, but it was also speaking out against us. So what is this? Well, it, it's hard to say, and a lot of commentators kind of debated on this, but as I studied it out, and I, as I kind of landed where a lot of them were, and just from a plain reading of the text, I think this is talking about the law. Not just the law and God's character saying this is right and this is wrong, but also, also with that, 
where I have gone wrong. You know, it'd be like uh, it'd be like a police charge. They they say you have violated this statute. This is what the statute says. This is what you were caught doing. You know, it, you can go on to the Hubbard County Jail website, and uh, it's not probably one that you check very often. I check it pretty often. I don't know it's a hobby. I just want to see if there's anybody that I know that's in jail. But uh, they have a picture of the person. Zach, I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, <laughs> You have the picture of the person, and then you have what date they were arrested, and then you have what they violated, what they did. You know, they possessed so many grams of meth, you know, over, and it's this, or or they were a victim, or they were guilty of domestic assault, or uh, lying to a corrections a peace officer, a corrections officer, or whatever. And so you have all these charges, and I think that's what it's talking about here. There, there was. Let's see if I have any. If I took all my sermon notes out here, um, they, there was something written again against you that said, this is what God expects. Instead, this is what you did. So now both of those things are bad for me. Both of those things are against me and contrary to me because it shows that I am guilty. Not only that, but a lot of commentators have pointed out too that if it is the law, then that means that as a, and this is going to come out later in the book, as a Gentile, the law said that I'm separated from God, right? This covenant is for the Jewish people, and I'm a Gentile. I'm separated from God. And again, the only reason I, I agree with that is because Ephesians says much the same thing. Over in Ephesians chapter 2, it says this, Wherefore, remember that ye, being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And again, he says this um, in chapter 3 of Ephesians, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he, hath, he made known unto me the mystery um, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now again, he goes on to that, and he just, so what we're talking about, that there was something that made it so that I couldn't have fellowship with God, either on a personal level because I'm a sinner and the law says I should do these things and I didn't do them, or because I'm a Gentile and God's law says this is for his people. And that was not true of me. Um, and this is what accused us. This is what Satan uses to accuse me. Satan uses this to accuse you. He's called the accuser of the brethren. And don't you think that Satan's in heaven um, saying, you know, Zach says he's a Christian, but look, right? Alice she, she wants everyone to think that she's a good Christian and that she loves you, but I've got proof that she doesn't love you, right? And, and Satan not only accuses us before God, he accuses us to ourselves. he accuses us to other people. That's where strife comes in because Satan is an accuser. The U.S. in World War II had tried sanctions. We tried treaties, but eventually it came to the point where we realized no war is needed. See, there's no treaty between you and God. If, if you have violated him, then, then there, there needs to be something that happens to take away the offenses, the trespasses that you have done. The handwriting of ordinances is against you. And we were trying to get Japan to leave China and uh, end their packs. We were saying, well, we'll, we'll, we'll sell you oil. We'll, we'll lift the embargo if only you'll leave China and uh, if you'll end your packs with Italy and Germany. And uh, that only seemed, in all our diplomacy, only seemed to anger Japan even more. They felt like we were being really heavy-handed. This is before they ever attacked um, World War II. Um, after then, they, they, or after uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, after Pearl Harbor then, and after the Axis in Europe had fallen, we called for unconditional surrender in Japan, and they again refused. So that's when we dropped the two nuclear bombs, and it wasn't very long after that that they surrendered. But treaties and sanctions weren't going to do it because there were offenses that had happened, and they were not willing to do anything about it. 
So what did Jesus do? The handwriting of ordinances that was against us, what did he do? It says in verse 14 that he blotted them out. Now, what does that mean? Well, the word literally means oil. It has something to do with oil. And so what it was was this. So you'd have a parchment paper, right? And someone would write on that paper, this is what you did. And, uh, and, and there it is in pen, on paper. There's no such thing as erasers, right? But what you could do is you could take a little bit of oil on a rag and you could take it over that ink and blot it out and rub it out. So there would still be a smudge there, but nobody could read what exactly had happened. It, it would be like expunging your record, taking it and, and, and making it so that all of your offenses were erased and that no one could read any sins against you. And if that weren't enough, now that would be enough. Wouldn't it be great if we could just say that Christ blotted out our transgressions? He didn't just do that because there's still the law. So for my transgressions, what I did, so here's, again, see Pastor Hunter, those are your notes? Yes. Um, on this side, what I should have done. On this side, what I didn't do. All the accusations. This side was blotted out, but there's still the law. What did he do with it? According to verse number 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now again, what I always understood is that Jesus took my sins and put them on his cross. But what Jesus, what God actually did, and the grammar supports that this is talking about God, is that he took the accusations, that the, the law, what it said that I should do, and he nailed that to Jesus' cross. Meaning this, so Pilate, when he accused Jesus, he said, this is the king of the Jews, right? This, this is what they did. They nailed that to the cross. What God did was that he nailed the law to the cross. The cross was where this is what they should have done. This is what they violated. This is the law that they violated. And what God did is nailed that to the cross so that the person underneath that sign was the one dying for what had gone wrong. So all of the things that I did against the law have all been paid for on the cross. Now, if you were sitting there looking at it, you would just see this is Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews, or Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. You would not see all the laws that you and I had broken. But in essence, that is exactly what was on the cross. And Jesus Christ not only kept the law, but then died for lawbreakers to keep the law. Thus, all the demands of the law were satisfied. Go over to Romans uh, chapter 10 really quickly, and we'll come back to Colossians in a minute. But go to Romans chapter 10 because I want you to see these words. In the context, Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul's talking about Israel and God's plan throughout redemption for Israel. But right in the middle of that is chapter 10. Chapter 10 has some of the great verses that you know about, especially if you know the Romans wrote. Amen. Mm -hmm. Look at verse number 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Christ is the end of the law. He lived it and he fulfilled it. Now, I cannot keep God's law, but Jesus Christ did. I can only break God's law, and yet Christ was punished for my breaking of the law. My sins have now been blotted out, and they have been nailed to Jesus' cross so that I can be declared a law keeper rather than a law breaker. Verse 4, again, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses... Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. If you're going to live by the law, you've got to keep all of it. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or, who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. The, the truth is that this law written 
against me and contrary to me, I couldn't do anything about. I couldn't go to heaven and plead my case. I, I couldn't go and before God's throne and say, this is why I feel like leniency should be made. I couldn't go. So God had to send Jesus to come. He came to this earth. He died on the cross for me. And he blotted out my transgressions. And he took that law that I could not keep and nailed it to the cross and said, this is what I expect out of every person. And your sins have been judged and your law, my law, has been kept. And the only way for us to get to heaven is to fold underneath Christ, who is the law keeper. I, I want to go from a lawbreaker to be a law keeper. Now that doesn't mean that we have no law. We have the law of Christ, which keeps us. Go back to Colossians chapter 2 and see this. Verses 16 and 17, he's going to go into this. We'll talk about this, Lord willing, next week. But verses 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of a Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And he's going to talk about this. Don't go back to Judaism because why would you go back to the law? The law doesn't that the law doesn't apply anymore. Not because it's not important. Not because God changed his mind, but because the law and um, and we talked about this. But the law was meant. Didn't I read this? I didn't. Romans three twenty. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law couldn't make anybody perfect. The law couldn't make anybody righteous. The law could only point out what we'd done wrong. It was a handwriting of ordinances that was against us, and all we could do is say, oh, what am I going to do? I have sinned against God, and there's no recourse. So why would we go back to the law? Why would we go back to something that couldn't actually save us? All those feasts, all those holy days, all those Sabbaths were wonderful for a picture, but the fulfillment was Jesus Christ. He was the one who did what we could not do. And that handwriting is now done, uh, that is now done is for good works. And this is the thing I love about this as I thought about this. There is still my deeds being written down, right? Before, all my sins were written down and the law was on the other side. When Christ went to the cross, when I accepted him as my savior, all my sins were blotted out and the law that I could not keep was nailed to the cross. And now there's still a pen scribbling about me. But uh, praise be to God, the first thing it did was scribble my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. And after that, all it's been doing is writing down the good that Christ has done through me. What is Christ doing in my life and through me? What are, All the works that are going in the book are what I have been able to uh, what Christ has been able to do through me, a vessel. And one day all those books will be opened and God will tell me what he's been able to do through me as I depended on him. And those things will be wood, hay, stubble, or hopefully gold, silver, and precious stones. And all those books will be opened and I'll be judged according to those things. And now there's a handwriting, but it's not against me. It's not contrary to me. Now there's a handwriting that is for me because it is in Christ. That is what Christ has done. He has won the victory over sin. Praise God. He's won victory over the law. We don't have to try to keep the law. We ought to do right because we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works, Ephesians 2.10 tells us. We ought to do right because um, we, grace should abound in our life, not through sin, but through obedience, through yieldedness, through allowing our members to be used by Christ. All those things are true, and keeping the law has nothing to do with it anymore. And then finally, Jesus won victory over the world. Verse 15 in Colossians 2 tells us this, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Verse 15 talks about principalities and powers. And sometimes, but I think even as I, as I studied this out this week and last week, as I studied this out, I do think that there's an element of this that are talking about demonic 
principalities and powers. Right, like we, we read about this a little bit in uh, chapter 1, verse 16. And in other places like Ephesians 6, it talks about principalities and powers, uh, the rulers of darkness. And so sometimes that word is used for that. But it's also it also could be talking about the earthly powers that put Jesus Christ to death. All the powers of the world tried to end Jesus. All the powers, satanic and earthly, all of them tried to come together. The whole power of the Roman Empire tried to kill Jesus and end him. And he did die, but then he rose again. And his resurrection showed him to be a victor. Now we'll get into this a little bit, but just set the stage for what, what he's talking about here. That Jesus has conquered the world. That Jesus has conquered both the prince of the power of the air and the literal kings of the earth. That he has given himself the title that God, through Christ's obedience, we'll talk about this in a little bit, has been given the title King of Kings and Lord of Lords through the cross. It was the cross that allowed him to have that title uh, as king over all. And again, going back to World War II, the U.S. and the Allies started to make the world better after World War II. They started to then, um, you know, the, the, they started to fight against the tyranny of Stalin and the USSR and communism. And, you know, one wonders, maybe there wasn't very much choice. We had to work with Stalin, but one wonders how the world would have been different if U.S. had entered the war sooner and if there had you know we wouldn't have had vietnam perhaps and korea perhaps if the spread of communism hadn't taken over if we hadn't allowed stalin to do everything that he did in world war ii and we can't go back and say but after world war ii we started to try to make the, we realized our, how important it was for us as a nation to get involved in the affairs of the world now it's a hard thing isn't it because when we think about america today we think, man, should we be in every part? Like, should we really have a, a naval base here and, a, and an air force base here? And should we really have people stationed in Italy and Japan and Germany and, and all these places? I mean, we've been friends with them for years. And, and then you leave Afghanistan and you find out just how important it is to have a presence. And you don't need a very big one, but just to have a presence there in these places in the world and how much everything around is safer when we have that presence. And again, I don't love the idea of a police state, but if we as, a, as America, uh, and again, we, we're losing our moral core, but if we had a strong moral core and a sense of responsibility, moral responsibility to keep evil at bay in the world, then how much, I think, better this world would be, how much better it has been when America is promoting that which is right in the world. Sadly, we're starting to lose influence. We're losing influence to Russia. We're losing influence to China. Um, some of you have probably heard that. Um, some of these Middle Eastern countries are now turning to Russia, and, and Russia and China are actually trying to change uh, right now. So right now, uh, oil and gas are, are traded in US dollars. They're trying to change that to the ruble and to, um, uh, what is it, yuan? Uh, whatever they use in, in China, they're trying to change that to undermine the United States. We're not talking about this just from an economic standpoint. If China, who is a huge human rights violator, and Russia, who is a huge human rights violator, if they gain influence of the world, millions of people will die. In other countries, we won't have that influence. Now, this isn't a political sermon. It's just to illustrate that there needs to be victory in the world, that we have that, that what we started in after World War II was the right way to go about it, and what we've done since then has been right. And it's only been in the last little while where we have lost influence in the world because, again, part of it is just uh, poor leadership, poor um, moral quality in, in our nation's leaders. And what, what Christ did in the world was to, to finally bring victory. And I want to bring this out a little bit as we go along. What did he do? Three things that are mentioned in verse 15. The first thing is that he spoiled principalities and powers. The word spoiled means to strip. So do you understand in ancient times when you went into battle and you won against the enemy, you had them on the run, so you, you and your army would fight and you'd push them back and push them back and finally you'd be watching all of their soldiers run off. And then you would turn around and what would you see behind you? Well, dead bodies all over the battlefield. Now, this isn't something that we like to think about. But when you think about the scarcity of weapons and armor and provisions, and you're a soldier and you've just won the battle, 
to the victor go the spoils. And especially if, if, if we're not just talking about a battlefield, if you go into a nation and take that nation, and let's say that they're a huge producer of pigs, or a huge producer of jewels, then as the conquering nation, I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying that this is the way it was, you would go in and you would say, no, all of this stuff is now ours. All this, all this, all this military might, uh, these, these, this armor and these weapons, they're ours, we will spoil them. We'll take them with us. It's, it's the same word there that's used in verse number eight, but it's the idea of stripping away the powers that were there. Now, for demonic powers, that means that Satan no longer has power over death, that he has been finally judged. And for worldly rulers, it means that he has shown himself heir of the world. Again, let's go over to Philippians chapter 2. should be not very far away. Philippians 2. I love this passage of Scripture. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, but took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, meaning because he did that, because Christ went to the cross, what did God do? God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The cross means that Jesus Christ has spoiled the principalities and powers of this earth, that he through the cross has become heir of the world. And again, we can go to 1 Corinthians 15 if we had time. We can show how Christ as the victor of Calvary became the victor of the world and that he has, he has already claimed kingship for himself over the world and one day will assume physical kingship over the world and will give all of that back to God. All of, all of the world will be subdued, and it started on the cross. He spoiled it. As Jesus told Pilate, you have no power. Because Pilate told him, remember, don't you know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? And Jesus said, you'd have no power at all except it were given from on high. And that was just a little proof of the power that was coming. One day your power will be spoiled. One day I'll take all of the power that you have. Isaiah 40, verse 17, speaking of the Messiah, says this, All nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. All the nations in the world, put them on a scale, they're less than nothing to God. They're, they, are, they have been already conquered. Next, it says that he made a show of them openly. He displayed his power over them. So again, what this would mean then, you're a conquering general. Your army has gone into the battlefield. You have set the enemy running. You have pursued them and not only killed all of their soldiers, but you've taken their land. And now it's time to spoil them. And you take those things and you parade them back to your country. You want to make sure that everybody knows this is our might. You want those soldiers marching with spears and swords so that nobody else wants to mess with you. <laughs> As you go and everyone sees the military might, they say, mm, maybe we should send an ambassador for peace. Maybe we should see if they'll make a deal with us. Nobody wants to deal with nobody wants to deal with that. And they would even, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, they would even take this, the people from those those countries and show this is what we've done to these countries. This is what we've done. You know, uh, the, the Assyrians would do this. This is what we've done to Syria. This is what we've done to Israel. What would you like? Well, I think I'd like to make a deal. I think I can see all of what you've done. They made a show of them openly. What does that mean? That he displayed his power over them. For demons, Jesus showed that Satan had not won, that Satan would be condemned. Jesus said in John, and I don't have the reference here, but he says, now is the prince of this world judged. That the prince of this world has been already condemned. 
Nobody knew that. Nobody could see that. But at the cross, it happened. For worldly rulers, Jesus demonstrated his power over what worldly powers rulers have no power over. What is the one thing that people like Stalin and Putin fear? Have you heard that Putin's going into like cancer treatments? They're not sure what's going on with him, but he has some health issues. Aren't you glad that death is a thing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing, like, we, we think about Adam and Eve and going into the garden and, and they took up the tree, and then Jesus, and then God says, uh, Let's not let them stay here lest they take the tree of life and live forever. Could you imagine if people like Stalin could live forever? Yeah. Imagine if Stalin could just, he was, he was untouchable, he'd be like a, a perfectly healthy 45-year-old for eternity, and all of his evil would just remain with him. Aren't you glad that, that, that one thing that will happen to all dictators is that they will die? Now, unfortunately, that means for us that good people will die as well. But, right, but there's one thing that Putin can't do, he can't stop his own demise. Right? As powerful as he is, one of the richest people in the world, and, and commanding an army and, and holding sway over the biggest nation in the world, there's something he doesn't have power over. He doesn't have power over death, and he doesn't have power over hell. And yet, on the cross, that's exactly what Jesus took power over and made it and it made a show of that openly. I have now conquered death and hell and Satan. I have I have conquered all of the things that you as the nations fear. Finally, then it says in verse number 15, triumphing over them in it. No, triumph, what is that? Well, it was actually a Roman, official Roman term. So if you've studied Roman uh, emperors at all, I talked about two of them this morning, but if you've studied uh, ancient Roman history at all, um, if a general did something, if he went on a campaign, you know, he went and he um, defeated the Gauls or he defeated the, the Visigoths, he would come back to Rome and he would ask the Senate for a triumph. That doesn't mean for a win. He would, he would ask them, can I do a parade? A military parade. Now, in America, we don't have military parades. I actually think it would be pretty awesome mm -hmm. if on the 4th of July we had some tanks rumble through and we had some soldiers with the guns. I, I feel like you want to... I feel like that'd be cool. I know people would, would be offended by that because it would be a show of strength. <laughs> but I just think that would be neat. But we don't do that anymore. But they did that back in Roman days. And again, what would happen is, is the general and all the armies would march through and they would have not only what you know their military might but they would show all the people of Rome these are all the slaves that we brought and this is all the money and all the jewels and all the the, the carriages of riches that we brought to put into the public coffers and all the people in the city would see this is the might of this general and they would throw roses at him and they would throw coins at him and, and the soldiers and they would be just joying over what this general would do and the general was happy to display everything that he did not just to make a show of them openly but then also to parade that through Rome it was an official term triumphing them over them in it so what how did Christ do that well for demonic powers he showed their powerlessness we already talked about this in Hebrews, but in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says, He also himself likewise took part of the saying that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus Christ, when he rose again, said, There is no death. So that Paul, Paul of all people, not Jesus Christ even, but Paul, could say, Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? I mean, here's Paul mocking something that he succumbed to eventually. He was killed and he was put in the grave. But even then, he's mocking it. Your power is gone. I've been in the victory parade. I've already been there to see death and hell and Satan taken over. There's nothing left. You do whatever you want to me. You are a defeated foe. For worldly rulers, Christ and his church has, has, has been strong throughout. Now you think about this, where's the Roman Empire today? Now I believe, biblically speaking, that there will be some kind of Roman Empire, some form of it, or somebody that at least wants to revive part of it, because as I read Daniel, I see that there are vestiges of it that are still yet to come. Now I could be wrong on that interpretation, but that's the way I understand it. But not that notwithstanding, where's the Roman Empire now? Where's the church? So the church has toppled regime, regimes. Part of what happened in the USSR was that people wanted religious liberty. People wanted freedom. 
and, and that the ethics that the church, as much as they tried to stamp out Christianity in the church, the church prevailed. And the church uh, has prevailed in the USSR and in Rome, and I believe if the Lord tarries, it will prevail in China, it will prevail in North Korea, that as much as these places are trying to squelch Jesus Christ, his kingdom is all over the world. His kingdom is in the concentration camps in North Korea. His kingdom is behind closed doors and in mosques of Iran. His kingdom is in remote villages in Papua New Guinea and on remote islands. His kingdom is in Africa already. His kingdom, of course, is here, but his kingdom is in every nation in the world. And as we take the gospel, it increases to every language in the world. His kingdom has stood for 2,000 years. And no, it's not very strong. But just like if you've ever seen roots of a tree that's grown up under a rock and has split that rock, Christ's kingdom has prevailed already. Why? Because 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5 tell us this. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? How are we overcoming the world? Through Christ, Revelation 12, 11, says that the tribulation saints overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. So what does that mean for us now? It means that Jesus is the victor, that there's no one, that there's nothing that overcome him. Sure, a church might close. Sure, a Christian might die, but Jesus Christ, his kingdom, has lasted and will last, and nothing can overcome him. Nothing and no one can take him off his throne. Like Stalin, uh, like Putin will one day die, like Stalin did, um, uh, what's his name, um, Lenin, is, his body is still there in Russia, and they, they parade people through that to see his dead body. Jesus Christ is not dead, he's coming back someday. And he not only is the victor, but he's coming again to reign over the nations and to bring us with him. And this is why I think Paul is writing to these people when they feel like they're losing, that he says, you have already, Christ has already won the victory. Jesus Christ has conquered the power of Satan. He is a defeated foe. Commentator N.T. Wright in his commentary in Colossians said this, and I, I thought about summarizing it, and then I thought, I'll just read it because it was so good. The rulers and authorities of Rome and of Israel, as Caird points out, the best government and the highest religion the world at that time had ever known conspired to place Jesus on the cross. These powers, angry at his challenge to their sovereignty, stripped him naked, held him to public contempt, and celebrated a triumph over him. In one of his most dramatic statement of the paradox of the cross, and one moreover which shows in what physical in what physical detail Paul could envisage the horrible death that Jesus had died, he declares that on the contrary, on the cross, God was stripping them naked and holding them up to public contempt and leading them in his own triumphal procession in Christ, the crucified Messiah. When the powers had done their worst, crucifying the Lord of glory incognito on the charge of blasphemy and rebellion, they had overreached themselves. That's great to think about Christ's victory over the world, over the law, and over sin. So when we feel like we are losing, when we feel like it just feels overwhelming sometimes, you look at the news and you're like, what can, I, what can be done? You know, what, what, can, what, what can change all of this? And, and sometimes we're tempted to get, I'm going to get on the phone with my senator. I'm going to, we're going to make sure that we get this next election. We're going to make sure that this happens and that happens. Uh, I, I'm all about getting involved where you can. I'm just, I just don't put a lot of hope in that. My hope is in the gospel. And I don't know that I can do anything for Putin except pray for him. But I know that I can make a difference in Park Rapids with the gospel, that I can preach, that I can disciple, that I can evangelize, that I can do that, and in the meantime, not get worried about what's going on in the world, because Christ has already won victory. He's already won victory over the world. He's already won victory over the law, and he's already won victory over my sin. Sin has no power over us. It has been won in Christ. The law has no power over us. We follow Christ's righteousness. 
and the world has no power over us. He has won already. Amen. Praise God for his victory. Amen. Lord, thank you for the victory that comes through Jesus.